What's going on besties? Today we're going to be talking about the T's version 7 science portion of the exam, more specifically chemistry, and we're going to be highlighting properties of solution. Let's get started. So water is truly a remarkable molecule. It's not just an essential when it comes to life, but it's because of its unique properties that makes it crucial for biological functions. One of the key features when it comes to water is its structure and polarity. Water molecules are shaped in such a way that oxygen atoms, which are highly electronegative, tends to attract more electrons towards itself compared to the hydrogen ions that it's bonded with. Oxygen and hydrogen form covalent bonds. As we discussed in our atomic structure video, oxygen with an atomic number of eight has eight protons and eight electrons two in its inner shell and six in its outer shell. It needs two more electrons to complete its outer shell based on that octet rule. It gets these electrons when two hydrogen atoms, which both have one valence electron in the outer shell, share with oxygen. This uneven distribution of electrons gives oxygen a slightly more negative charge and hydrogens a slightly more positive charge. This polarity allows water molecules to easily bond with each other. The slightly negative oxygen of one molecule can attract the slightly positive hydrogen of another, forming a hydrogen bond. These bonds are what gives water its special properties, such as its ability to dissolve many substances, its surface tension, and its relatively high boiling point compared to other molecules of similar size. Have you ever observed how water sticks to the side of a glass and wondered, how does water stick to a glass without falling down? Does it defy gravity? What's particularly interesting about water is its ability to adhere to the walls or surfaces of objects, a phenomenon known as adhesion, which assists in countering gravity's pull. Furthermore, water molecules form hydrogen bonds amongst themselves. This process is called cohesion. For this, I want you to picture water droplets on a waxed car's surface. They tend to beat up because they prefer sticking to each other rather than spreading out all over the surface of the car. Additionally, cohesion explains why water striders, those little bugs, which are my favorite insects by the way, can effortlessly move across the surface of a pond or a stream without actually having to go into the water. This is because cohesion enhances the surface tension of water, enabling these little bugs to skate across it without sinking. So here's the key difference between these two concepts. When it comes to adhesion, we have water molecules that are attracted to dissimilar objects, meaning they're attracted to something else besides themselves. Themselves. Whereas with cohesion, their attraction is going to take place between the water molecules themselves. So cohesion, they're going to be co-working together. That's your memory trick, co-worker, co-home. They like to stick to each other, right? They're at home when they're with each other. Whereas adhesion is they're sticking to dissimilar things, things that are not water. So I like to think of it as adhesive tape. Where water molecules are like sticky objects, like we see with adhesive tapes, when it comes to sticking to walls or different different surfaces. So let's talk about another important concept when it comes to the T's, and that is solute, solvent, and solutions. So let's begin by exploring what constitutes a solution with a simple experiment involving three different glasses of water. In the first glass, we're going to add salt. In our second glass, we're going to add sugar. And in our third glass, we're going to add pebbles. After allowing some time for these examples to interact with water, we're going to observe the following. The salt is going to completely dissolve, forming what we know as a homogeneous mixture. This means that the mixture is going to have a uniform composition. And with looking with just our naked eye, we're not going to be able to differentiate between the salt particles and the water. Just like with our salt, sugar is also going to dissolve completely in the water, resulting in another homogeneous mixture. We're also not going to be able to differentiate between the sugar particles and the water itself. So again, it's going to have a uniform composition. However, unlike salt and sugar, the sand or pebbles that we put in our last water is not going to dissolve. This results in what we know as a heterogeneous mixture, where the individual particles of sand or pebbles are going to remain visible and distinct from the water. 
From these observations, we can conclude that both the salt water and sugar water mixtures are solutions because they consist of substances, both salt and sugar, that are soluble in water, forming homogeneous mixtures. On the other hand, the mixture of pebbles in water is not a solution due to its heterogeneous nature in which the substances remain visible to the eye. Thus, a solution is defined as a homogeneous mixture of one or more solutes where the components are completely dissolved in a solvent, leaving no visible trace of separation to the naked eye. So here are some common examples of solutions to illustrate this concept. When we're looking at cold drinks, we have a combination of carbon dioxide, sugar, flavors, as well as water. When mixed together, they form a homogeneous mixture. This means all components are evenly distributed throughout the drink, making it a solution. In the case of fog and clouds, water vapors are dissolved in air, making it a homogeneous mixture. And lastly, when alcohol is mixed into water, it dissolves completely, resulting in our last homogeneous mixture. The uniform distribution of alcohol molecules within the water makes us a classic example of a solution. All three of these examples represent solutions where the solute is completely dissolved in the solvent, creating a uniform mixture without any visible separation of components. Let's delve into solutes and solvents by examining a salt solution and a sugar solution. In both cases, these solutions consist of two components, salt and water in the salt solution and sugar and water in the sugar solution. As we discussed before, both salt and sugar can be dissolved in water and present in smaller quantities compared to the water itself. Therefore, we define a solute as a component of a solution that can be dissolved and is present in smaller amounts. Conversely, a solvent is defined as its ability to dissolve substances and is present in larger amounts. So this makes sense in our example, right? We have both salt and sugar, which are smaller amounts, making them our solutes. And both water in both cases is going to be our solvent because it's gonna be present in larger amounts. An easy way to remember the differences is sugar water syrup, where our solute is sugar, our solvent is water, and our solution is syrup. It's also easy to recall that as we move down our list of definitions, our number of characters in each word is going to increase. Solute has six characters, solvent has seven characters, and solution has eight. Here are some more common examples of solutes and solvents. In a vinegar solution, we can see that acetic acid is going to be our solute, it's a much smaller number, and our water is going to be our solvent because it's in greater quantity. Moving down the line, we have sugar and milk. Sugar is going to be our solute, and milk is going to be our solvent. And then with alcohol and water, again, alcohol is going to be our solute and water is going to be our solvent. If you haven't been able to pick up on it yet, water is often hailed as the universal solvent because of its exceptional ability to dissolve a wide variety of substances, particularly polar substances. Polar substances such as salt, which is sodium chloride, and sugar, which is sucrose, dissolve well in water. This is due to the partial charges on their molecules, which attract the partial charges on water molecules, thus facilitating dissolution. Conversely, we have nonpolar substances like we see with oils and fats, which often struggle to dissolve in water. Their molecules lack charged regions, which are necessary to effectively interact with water molecules. Therefore, although water can dissolve numerous types of substances, it is predominantly effective with polar substances, earning its reputation as the universal solvent. Additionally, when preparing for your ATITs, you're going to come across two important terms, hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Hydrophobic means water fearing or water hating, and it describes substances that do not dissolve well in water and tend to repel it. This category includes oils, fats, as well as other nonpolar molecules. Examples of hydrophobic materials in daily use could be waterproof fabrics, which are treated to repel water. Hydrophilic means water loving, and it refers to substances that dissolve readily in water. This includes polar substances and molecules like ionic compounds, such as salt, and polar molecules, such as alcohol. Many beverage ingredients are hydrophilic, allowing them to dissolve in water. 
Because water itself is a polar molecule, hydrophilic substances can disintegrate and become encased in water molecules, which aids in their dissolution. So let's discuss molarity, a term frequently used when discussing solutions. We often refer to a substance's concentration rather than simply counting its moles. The concentration tells us the number of moles of a substance present per unit of volume. The unit of measure for concentration and molarity is expressed as moles of a solute per liter of solution and is denoted by the capital M. For instance, a solution with a molarity of 2M contains 2 moles of solute for every liter of solution. We can change the concentration of a solution through the process of dilution, which involves adding more solvent to the solution. As a result, if the number of moles of solute remains constant, then the solution becomes less concentrated because of the overall volume increase. To calculate the new concentration after dilution, we use a specific calculation that requires the initial concentration, the initial volume, and the final volume to which the solution will be diluted. These quantities are inversely related, meaning that if you double the volume of the solution, the concentration will be halved. So let's take a look at an example. We have calculate the molarity of a solution prepared by dissolving 9.8 moles of a solid NaOH in enough water to make 3.62 liters of solution. So we know what our moles are and we know what our solution is in liters, so we just go ahead and we plug that into our molarity equation. So we have M is equal to 9.8 moles over 3.62 liters, and we're just going to divide. And that's gonna give us a molarity of 2.7 moles per liter. So let's take a look at a more complex problem. So we have 0.850 liters in a 5M solution of sodium chloride is diluted to a volume of 1.8 liters. So we have our original volume and our new volume here with water. What is the concentration of the diluted solution? So we start with our equation. We have M1 multiplied by V1 is equal to M2 multiplied by V2. So that's just your first moles, your first volume, your second moles, your second volume. So here we need to figure out what our second moles is if we dilute the solution with 1.8 liters. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that on the left side of my equal sign and I'm gonna multiply my first solution which is our M1 V1 and I'm going to divide that by what we added for the dilution of our second solution. So we're just gonna go ahead and plug in our numbers. So we have 5M is multiplied by 0.85 liters. This is our first solution and it's gonna be divided by what we have added to dilute the solution of 1.80 liters. If we do our calculations correctly, we should see that the molarity, the moles that we see in our second solution is now going to be 2.36 moles. Osmosis is a term that is often mentioned, but can be quite complex to grasp. However, understanding it can clarify numerous important questions that you may have, such as, why is it harmful to administer an IV of pure water? Or what happens when a saltwater fish is placed in fresh water? We'll explore the answers to these questions while explaining the process of osmosis. When we're discussing osmosis, we're referring to how water molecules move through a semi-permeable membrane such as a cell membrane. Due to their small size, water molecules can pass through the membrane unaided, or if we have a large quantity of water molecules, they can move through a specialized protein channel known as an aquaporin. This transport of water molecules across the cell membrane is considered a passive transport, meaning that it doesn't require any energy in order to get across. Water molecules naturally migrate from areas where their concentration is high to where their concentration is low. Another way to consider this movement is to consider solute concentration, a region where a low water concentration generally means that we're going to see a higher concentration of solutes like salt and sugars. Since these solutes are dissolved in a solvent like water, the water will tend to move towards areas with higher solute concentrations, which correspondingly have lower water concentrations. Thus, if you're trying to predict the direction of water molecules in osmosis, simply look for concentrations that have greater solutes. In the absence of other influences like pressure, water is going to continuously move towards the area of higher solute concentrations. 
An easy way that I like to remember osmosis is to think of H2O and O and osmosis. This means that it's going to be the movement of water. So let's introduce what is known as the YouTube setup. Yes, it's a little bit like YouTube the platform, but it's a little bit more scientific. In the middle of our YouTube, we're going to have semi-permeable membranes, similar to a cell membrane, which allows small water molecules to pass through, but blocks large molecules like salt. Initially, when we take a look at our first example, we can see that both side A and side B are filled with equal levels of water. While it may appear nothing is happening, water molecules are constantly in motion. However, the net movement between the two sides is zero, meaning there's no overall change in the direction of the water movement. So let's add a twist. Suppose we add a significant amount of salt to side B. Given what we know about osmosis, in which direction do you think the water is going to move? Side A or side B? And you're absolutely correct, it is side B. Side B now has a higher solute concentration compared to side A. Water naturally moves towards area with higher solute concentrations, which also means that we're going to see a lower water concentration on that side. Consequently, the water level on side B is going to rise as water attempts to move to dilute and equalize that concentration on both sides. Once equilibrium is achieved, that net movement of water across the membrane will stop yet the water molecules will continue to move back and forth dynamically. This continuant movement reflects the natural kinetic behavior of water molecules, always seeking to balance and redistribute themselves. Here's a key term that you're going to need to remember. Side B is going to be described as hypertonic. This means that it has a higher solute concentration. However, it's important to note that calling something hypertonic always involves a comparison. So in this case, we can say that side B is hypertonic relative to side A because it contains more solutes than we see in side A. We can also refer to side A as hypotonic. The mnemonic hypo rhymes with low, hypo low. And this can help you remember hypotonic areas having a lower solute concentration compared to their counterparts. So now let's apply these concepts beyond the YouTube experiment and into more real life practical scenarios. When someone receives an IV at a hospital, the fluid in the IV might appear to be pure water, but in reality, it's definitely not. Using pure water would be extremely harmful because of osmosis. Let's consider why. Let's imagine that hypothetically the pure water was used in an IV. This IV tube typically runs into the vein, providing direct access to the bloodstream, which is crucial for medication administration. Your blood contains various components, including red blood cells. Now let's consider solute concentrations. Between the hypothetical pure water of an IV and your red blood cells, which one has the higher solute concentration? Since cells are not empty, but do contain various solutes, and the hypothetical pure water has none, the solute concentration inside the red blood cell is going to be higher. Due to osmosis, water moves from the low solute concentration in the IV, which we see with pure water, towards the higher concentration inside of our cells. As a result, the red blood cells, which are hypertonic compared to the pure water, is going to rush into this cell and it's going to cause that cell to start to swell and become full of water and potentially even bursting, which could be really bad for the organism. When a person requires hydration through an IV, they're usually given a solution that is isotonic to their body and their plasma. Isotonic means that the solution is equal in concentrations of solutes to the plasma, preventing that osmotic imbalance. Therefore, there will be no swelling or shrinking of red blood cells, ensuring their normal function is maintained. Hypertonic means that these solutions have higher concentrations of solutes compared to another solution. An easy way that I like to remember this is hyper rhymes with higher, hyper higher. Because there's going to be a higher solute imbalance when it comes to hypertonic solutions, we're going to see water coming out of our red blood cells because it's outside environment solutes are gonna be greater than the solutes found within the cells. So as we know with osmosis, osmosis, the water is gonna go from a lower concentration to a higher concentration in order to even it out. So you're going to see shell sh cell shrinking 
whenever we're talking about hypertonic solution because of that lack of water. Conversely, hypotonic solution refers to a lower concentration of solutes compared to other solutions. And an easy way that I like to remember this is hypo means low. It just it rhymes and it makes it easy to remember. So because the solution has less solutes than we're going to find inside of our red blood cells, the same thing is going to happen with osmosis. It's going to want to move towards these cells with a higher concentration. And because of this, it's going to cause the red blood cells to ultimately swell up and potentially burst depending on how imbalanced those solutes are. So when you're trying to figure out which kind of solution is isotonic, hypertonic, or hypotonic, this is an easy way that I like to remember it. The two solutions that you're going to see commonly with isotonic is going to be your normal saline 0.9%, uh, as well as your lactated ringers. If you're looking at hypertonic, hyper meaning higher, you're going to see a lot higher numbers. You're going to see 3% to 5% saline, 10% dextrose and water. 5% dextrose in normal saline or half normal saline. You're going to even see 5% dextrose in uh, lactated ringers. So you're going to see higher percentages, meaning that there's higher solutes. In contrast, where we're talking about hypotonic solution, hypo meaning low, you're going to see lower concentrations, right? So you're going to see half normal saline. You're going to see 0.225% normal saline and 0.33% normal saline. Next up, let's talk about diffusion, which refers to the process where the net movement of a substance moves down its concentration gradient, traveling from an area of high concentration to one of a low concentration. So the big key difference here when we compare to osmosis is osmosis is referring to the water. We're talking about the solvent. Whereas now we're talking about the movement of particles, not the movement of water. So we're talking about the solutes. So that's why it's going to be a little bit different from what we were talking about with osmosis. What's well, important to note that this process isn't limited to liquids. It can also refer to gases, such as air fresheners when they're sprayed up into the air. The molecules of an air freshener spread from where they are most concentrated to where they are less concentrated, allowing the scent to be detected even from a distance. Let's also delve into some key points when it comes to diffusion. The first term being net movement, which refers to the overall direction of the molecule movement. Diffusion doesn't prevent molecules from moving in the opposite direction, nor does it imply that the molecular movement ceases altogether. Even when equilibrium is reached, where the concentration of molecules is equal throughout the space, the molecules continue to move around, just like we saw with osmosis. Secondly, diffusion is a type of passive transport, meaning that it doesn't require any external energy to occur. Molecules move due to the inherent potential energy present in the concentration gradient itself. This is why the diffusion of a substance like oxygen into cells is considered passive transport. No additional energy is required for this to happen. Passive transport is distinct from processes like active transport, which requires energy input. Before we move on to that, we have one specific type of diffusion known as facilitated diffusion. This process still involves the net movement of molecules from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. However, certain molecules may be too large or possess other characteristics that prevent them from crossing the cell membrane itself. In such cases, these molecules have to pass through a protein channel. This is still considered diffusion because it's a form of passive transport and the molecules continue to move along their concentration gradient. The key difference is that facilitated diffusion requires the presence of a protein channel to assist the molecule in entering the cell. Let's talk about several factors that can influence the rate of diffusion. So number one, we have distance. So the further the molecule has to travel, the slower the diffusion rate. For instance, diffusion might occur at different rates in five feet compared to five miles due to the increased distance the molecule must travel. Next up, we have temperature. So quick question, do you think a higher or lower temperature would increase the diffusion rate, assuming all other factors are going to remain the same? You're right, generally higher temperatures are going to increase the diffusion rate. This is because the molecules move more rapidly at higher temperatures, enhancing their energy, which in turn speeds up diffusion. Next up, we have solvent characteristics, which just means that the density of a solvent can also impact diffusion. The denser a solvent is might impede molecular movement, 
thereby reducing the diffusion rate. And then we have traveling characteristics. Not all entities involved in diffusion are strictly molecules. There can be other types of substances as well. For example, the mass of a diffusing substance plays a critical role. Typically, substances with greater masses diffuse slower than those with less mass due to their inertia. And then lastly, we have barrier characteristics. If a diffusion involves crossing a barrier, such as a cell membrane, the nature of the barrier significantly affects the rate of diffusion. Small nonpolar substances generally pass through cell membranes more easily than those with larger, more polar substances, influencing the overall rate of diffusion. So we talked about passive transportation when it comes to diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. You should know one more additional mode of transport when it comes to the ATITs, and that is active transport. Active transport is a critical cellular process where molecules are transported against their concentration gradient, moving from areas of lower concentration to areas of higher concentration. Unlike passive transport, which allows molecules to move along the gradient without using energy, active transport requires the cells to expend that energy in order to make that happen. This energy is typically provided in the form of ATP, also known as adenosine triphosphate, the cell's primary energy currency. In active transport, cells use specialized protein channels embedded in the cell's membrane known as transporters or pumps. These proteins bind to the molecules they are designed to transport, changing shape with the energy derived from ATP to move these molecules across the cell membrane. This process is vital for maintaining essential functions such as nutrient uptake, waste removal, and ion balance within the cell. Active transport is not only crucial when it comes to individual cells, it is also pivotal when it comes to physiological processes across organisms. For example, it helps with the accumulation of nutrients across a concentration gradient like we see in our intestines and with the reabsorption of ions that we see within our kidneys. By understanding active transport, researchers and medical professionals can better comprehend cellular and systemic functions, potentially leading to improved treatments for various health conditions where transport processes can be disrupted. I hope this video was helpful in understanding properties of solutions. If you have any questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Questions, head over to nursechunkstore.com where there is a ton of additional resources to help you pass those ATIT's exams. And as always, I'm going to catch you in the next video. Bye!